Welcome everyone. I'm Anika, I'm part of the IG Unit team as you heard. And before I'll talk about our research project, I want to tell you a little story. The story of a girl named Emily Whitehead. Emily was living a regular life and was a healthy girl until when she was just five years old, she got diagnosed with cancer. More specifically, a blood cancer type called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, Emily had to spend her days at the hospital, unlike the healthy kids her age. She couldn't go to school or kindergarten. In the hospital, she went to the chemotherapy. You probably know what chemotherapy is. Um, chemotherapy is a cancer treatment where drugs are used to fight the cancer. Now, Emily went to chemotherapy twice. And by the age of seven years, so two years after her diagnosis, she still had cancer and no chemotherapy had worked for her. So at that point, the doctors ran out of options and sent her home, telling her parents that she wouldn't survive. Now, at that point, her parents had nothing to lose anymore. And they heard about a new type of treatment called cell therapy. More specifically, CAR T cell therapy. This therapy had never been tested on a child before and never on a patient with every type of cancer. So they had nothing to lose and they went along with it. And Emily was cancer free within weeks. This treatment saved Emily's life. Today she's 14 years old and just celebrates seven years without cancer. Now, you might ask yourself what is this miraculous treatment and how can it save the lives? So let's have a look what cancer actually is before we go into the details of the therapy. In cancer, cells grow uncontrollably and outgrow the healthy cells in the body. Now, in any specific kind of cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the lymphoblasts were the cells that outgrew the healthy cells. Lymphoblasts are normally part of the blood. And in leukemia, they grow too much and outgrow healthy blood cells. There's another big problem with cancer because normally when you have bad or broken cells in the body, your immune system can recognize and destroy these cells. Now cancer cells have a way to escape the immune system, so your immune system can't fight the cancer cells. How this exactly works would be a 15 minute talk by itself, so we can't go into that. But um, keep that in mind because CAR T cell therapy that saved Emily's life overcomes this problem by activating the immune system so that it can find cancer cells. Now let's go through the treatment step by step. CAR T cell therapy. How it works is that immune cells are taken out of the patient's body. Then in the laboratory, these immune cells called T cells are modified so that they can now detect cancer cells. How this works is that a receptor <laughs> called chimeric antigen receptor, and this is where the name CAR uh, T cells comes from, this receptor is added to the cells, and with this receptor, they can now find the cancer cells. So the cancer cells basically can't escape the immune system anymore. Now these modified um, T cells are infused back into the patient's body, and now they can act as the effective immune system and fight it. Now, as great as this therapy sounds, and as great as it is, there are still some problems with it. Because imagine you take living cells and put them into a patient. These cells are time-consuming and expensive to make, and they only work for one patient because they have to be the patient's own immune cells. Imagine they're in the body now, and they want to know, does the treatment work or not? Are the CAR T cells doing what they should do? How are the CAR T cells doing in the body? The CAR T cells will spread in the body wherever there's cancer, wherever there are cancer cells to fight. So how can we monitor how they're doing? Until now, you would have to take the CAR T cells out of the body again, wherever they are now. You will have to destroy the cells in order to access the inside information and get the information about their cell state. Now, with um, cell destruction, another problem arises because now you can't analyze them over a long period.
period of time because you destroy them and then you know. Um, so we thought, I mean, to our project now, there should be a way to overcome this problem and to analyze how the cells are doing without having to invasively take them out and destroy them. There should be a way to analyze cells while keeping them alive. And alive is actually the model of our project. Alive stands for analysis of living cells by vesicular experts. And what this exactly means and what we're doing, Alex will explain. Um, before we're walking through this method step by step, let us shortly again summarize for them. We are aiming for a method that allows us to monitor cells without touching them, so without harming them, so we can analyze them over a longer period of time. So let us start with our approach directly after the injection of CAR T cells into the body. The CAR T cells are now in the body and two questions. Are these CAR T cells alive and are they functional? And because we do not want to harm the cell, we cannot touch the cell by this analysis because touching would be harming or even killing the cell. So how do we analyze the cells that kill instead? The good thing is that cells have a kind of communication system. By this communication system, cells can share information with the surrounding cells. And this information, one cell is sharing with other cells, is transported by so-called vesicles. Vesicles can be imagined as small bubbles Filled, uh, surrounded by a membrane and filled up with some stuff the cell wants to get rid of. If we now have a deeper look into these vesicles, we can see that they contain sometimes trash like damaged proteins, but also valuable information for other cells. And because these vesicles are naturally produced by cells and uh, naturally produced all the time, it's a good idea to use this communication mechanism to receive information from the cells. So, we thought, or we are doing, the hijacking of this mechanism. Hijacking means that we are reprogramming our cells, meaning that we put some information into the cell, which is specifically loaded to these vesicles, shown in blue. We also add some adapters that load this information specifically into these vesicles. And the information we are loading is not naturally occurring in humans normally. Why are we using uh, not naturally occurring information? Because if you would take a natural occurring information and analyze the vesicles in later steps, you cannot be sure if this natural information is from the cell we are interested in or from any other cell of the body. Therefore, we are using uh, not naturally occurring information to overcome this problem. So, this was the general overview of how our project works. And now, let us shortly summarize this. We are using a naturally occurring communication mechanism, the vesicles, modify them slightly so that they load a not naturally occurring information. So and I hope you are still interested and want to know more about this because now it's getting even more interested because we're going deeper into this approach. Um, yeah, you, you might have asked yourself to this uh, general explanation. How do they load information specifically into the vesicles? And what kind of information are they loading? To answer the second question first, the information we are loading is RNA. RNA is a messenger molecule containing some information. And what you can see on the right side of the slide is that RNA can form structures, like right here shown as a hairpin. So RNAs can form hairpin structures. And these RNA structures can be recognized by RNA recognizing proteins. RNA recognizing proteins can tightly bound, bind to these structures and therefore detect the location. So now it's very easy to load this RNA specifically into our vesicles because we can fuse this RNA recognizing protein to natural and vesicles occurring proteins shown here in blue. And because this blue protein is by natural mechanisms loaded into the vesicle, um, we, we load also the RNA recognizing protein into the vesicle and therefore also the captured RNA. So finally, we have our vesicle built up with the natural occurring vesicular protein, the RNA recognizing protein, and the information, the RNA we want to get loaded specifically into the vesicle. And now the vesicles are exported out of the cell and can be found in body fluids, for instance in the blood. So with our method, we could take out the patient's blood, isolate the vesicles out of the blood, 
and analyze the vesicles if they contain our information or not. If the vesicles contain our information, we can be quite sure that our, that our cells are still alive. And why we are putting so much effort into this project and think that it's worth to work on it will be explained to you now by Okay, so now we've talked about how it works, let's go back to why we're doing what we're doing. Um, Annika already told you what CAR T cell therapy as a cell therapy is, so I'm not going to go into that again. We're going to look at cell replacement therapy. There's a small difference between the two. In cell therapy, you use cells that have a function the body in action does not. So in the CAR T cell example, we have this chimeric antigen receptor that the body does not actually have, and only with this receptor you can find and kill the cancer cells. Now, in the cell replacement therapy, on the other hand, you simply replace a broken down, damaged, or unfunctional tissue without introducing a new function. So, to look into an example, to make this less confusing, let's look into beta cells. Beta cells are cells inside your pancreas that produce insulin. And insulin is a very important molecule for your blood sugar management. During a, a disease called diabetes 1, type 1 diabetes, um, your immune system attacks and kills these uh, beta cells, meaning you no longer produce insulin on your own, you no longer manage your blood sugar on your own. Uh, what you currently have to do about this is that you have to inject insulin over pumps or syringes multiple times a day, very cost expensive, it's also pretty unpleasant, and sulfur or sulfur replacement therapy thought, how, what, what is it if we can uh, implant a cell that then produces insulin again, and you again, no longer have to uh, do the insulin um, injection on your own. So this is what beta cell transplants are for. They're already being used, and they do exactly that. They produce insulin after transplantation. And we have the same problem here as before. We don't want to take cells back out to check if they're working. We want to check them while they're inside, which is what we want to use alive for. We want these cells to produce vesicles that we can then analyze, and check if the beta cells actually produce insulin, if they're getting attacked by the immune system again, um, and all without taking a cell back out. So that's pretty cool, and we're actually not that far off this either. We're testing beta cells in our laboratory right now, whether they can produce and load uh, information into these vesicles. But let's look at a more complex and more vision-oriented idea. Synthetic organs. So currently in organ transplantation, you have a recipient that needs a organ and you have a donor that can give the organ away. But this is currently pretty unbalanced because you have a lot of people needing organs and not a lot of donors because most people need their organs. And um, what we, or what scientists thought, is why don't we produce these organs inside the laboratory, making this whole system much bit better, much easier. Um, and we think we can help this in two ways. First of all, during growing an organ inside the laboratory, this is a very complex uh, idea because you have a lot of cell types that have to work with each other, and in the end, if your organ does not look like or does not function the way you want it to, you don't really know why in the first place. So, when using a live, these cells will produce vesicles that you can then analyze and track back the problem by knowing what should be inside the vesicle, and if it's not, then you track back, back which cell did not do what it was supposed to do, and you fix the problem. This is our vision for the first part. Now, if you have the functioning organ, and then you transplant it, these cells still produce vesicles. The cool thing is, now we can take the vesicle out of the blood, and then check again how is this, uh, the transplant, the organ, doing inside the patient. Is it functional? Is it being attacked by the immune system, which would be an organ rejection? Again, just over the blood. So, to summarize what our idea is for our life, we have a packaging system where information is packed into vesicles that are then being secreted into the bloodstream, which we want them to isolate the vesicles out of and analyze what the cell is doing. Applications we thought of as cell therapy, like RT cells, cell replacement therapy as uh, beta cells, which we're already working on, and our vision for the future is to revolutionize or impact synthetic organs um, when they finally are a real thing. So with this, I want to finally thank our sponsors, which is the Almir and the Tung, as well as the Nano Center Munich, and our industrial sponsors, and thank you for your attention.
the Amkhurst side. Okay, I just come to you. Um, um, to the example with the uh, how do you extract the vesicles to the after extracting, ex extracting the, um, the modified um, sources itself? That's a good question. We thought of that as well. And currently, you're right, since this is a blood cancer, the, blood, uh, the cells are fighting, we'll also extract these CAR T cells out of the blood as well. But the goal for CAR T cell therapy is not only to fight blood cancer, but in the, all, in the end also uh, tissue cancer. So that is a different field because then the cells wander into the tissue, which then we have to invade, just, not just the blood cell, and not just the blood. Okay, there is a question here. Please ask the Yes, uh, also a good question. Um, the difference is when the insulin level drops, this is already a symptom. So, for example, at that point, blood sugar rises, you have to immediately do something. That's an acute problem. Over the vesicle analysis, analysis we hope to prevent this by looking at how the cells are doing. And if they're doing bad, the insulin production will at this point still be fine. So, for example, if some cells die, the other cells might at this point just produce more insulin and you don't realize there's a problem yet. So over the vesicles you can detect the problem or we envision the problem to be detected much earlier than over the actual symptom, making more time to uh, treat the patient. Question. Do you measure the level of the vesicles or do you change themselves? So the, I just repeat the question because you have a microphone. Uh, the question is do you measure the level of the vesicles or how they change? Yes. Um, we would, uh, we would look at markers that we load into the vesicles and the change of either the abundance or the kind of markers inside the vesicles would tell us what the problem or what the current situation is. There was well, just in front, there's another question here. And there, I see there is one in the back, then there's the next one. So, hi, I'm um, Greg uh, I want to ask for your delivering RNA, the RNA binding protein, which is used in the receptor, which is quite a complex system, so how do you deliver this into the cells? Sorry. Okay. So currently we're, um, because in the course of the eye gen, we can only do transient changes in the cell, basically, of DNA. We just um, put DNA fragments that we change where basically all the parts are as we want them to be in the cells, and then they will produce the proteins like we designed the DNA fragments, basically. And then, answer the question? Yeah, the future, the metaphor, the therapy. Okay, therapy, you want um, to um, insert the fragments, the change the DNA fragments, temp um, into the genome of the cells, so it will not be temporarily, but stay there. Thanks. There was a question on the back, and you were saying there was not, yes, on the on the my right, <laughs> the left side, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, Please put it closer to your mouth. Yeah, really not the phrase. Uh, the technology uh, maybe would uh, revolutionize the transportation system. So proud of that. Um, my question concerns your uh, example of the DDT1. Uh, so the data um, uh, what is basically what is the guarantee that the body won't uh, attack the new uh, form of the data cells? Are the vesicles somewhat specific or um, how is it done? Just to clarify, do you mean is there a difference between our vesicles and the natural vesicles? Or what was the question? Yeah, concerning the incident produced from the beta cells that she implanted. I think the question was that uh, will your new uh, implanted cells somehow different from what we used before, so, or they still can be attacked by the new system? Okay, I understand now. Okay. Um, 
So, different points. Um, the first one is what currently is being done to put the beta cells into the patients to put them in a different place, and then this actually works for a long period of time. Um, what also has been uh, a field of research is to pack these beta cells into like a package, like a pouch, a membrane pouch, and then they can still produce insulin and um, the exosomes and they go through, but the, there's no actual connection between immune cells and beta cells anymore because they're in this membrane pouch. So now, when using this technology, the immune cells can no longer detect or attack the beta cells. Thanks, I think that's a good topic for the next talk probably, that you should prepare now. And I think we don't have any more time for questions, unfortunately, but we can ask more in the break. Thank you very much. Thank you.